To sum, the war in Ukraine is a conflict between two different kinds of nationalism. The aggressive delusional ideology that rationalized Putin's invasion of Ukraine on behalf of Russian speakers there, and the inspiring patriotism of the Ukrainians standing up to Russian aggression. What is nationalism and how does this viewpoint apply to understanding the current conflict in Ukraine? Are there any lessons that we can learn about the role of this viewpoint in understanding contemporary American politics? Well, welcome to New Ideal Live, the podcast of the Ayn Rand Institute. Today, we will discuss this topic, nationalism and Russia's war on Ukraine. I'm Ben Baer, fellow at the Ayn Rand Institute. With me is my colleague, a senior fellow at ARI, Ilan Giorno. Hi, Ilan. Hey, Ben. Yes, the, the news is really grim. As people who are following the news will have recognized, the Russian forces have gone deep into Ukraine. They've besieged a number of major cities in the north and the east and along the Black Sea coast, uh, occupying at least one city so far. And today, uh, March 16th, that's as far as we know, they've gotten, of course, the capital of Kiev is under constant bombardment and its suburbs are the scenes of intense urban warfare. And as it happened uh, some time ago, we know that Vladimir Putin put his uh, nuclear forces on high alert. So that, that's where the conflict is right now. Ben, take us toward how people are reacting to this. Right. Well, I think one thing for one thing's for sure is that nobody expected uh, this conflict to draw out as long as it has. The expectation was that the massive uh, Russian army would just roll over the Ukrainians and that they would they would control the country within a few days. That didn't happen. The uh, Ukrainians have put up uh, quite a valiant defense. Uh, they're still controlling uh, their major cities, though these cities are under siege. Uh, notable, I think, has been Vladimir, Vladimir Zelensky's uh, inspiring leadership uh, in defense of his people. Uh, he just spoke to the U.S. Congress this morning. Uh, and I think in part because of this defense, the, the West has shown, I think, rare unity in support of Ukraine. They've imposed severe economic sanctions against uh, the Russians. The Russian economy is, is really starting to collapse. The ruble is plummeting. But uh, in spite of all of that, uh, the casualties in the conflict have still been quite severe. It's, it's hard to know exactly how many people have died on either side. Each side gives different figures, uh, usually estimating that the other has lost more. But by just about any measure, thousands of people, including soldiers and civilians, have died. Uh, and millions of refugees have now fled Ukraine, mostly uh, to neighboring countries west of them, especially Poland. And it's it's quite a tragic circumstance. And I think especially for those of us who were witness to the fall of the Berlin Wall, the collapse of the Soviet Union and the kind of apparent end of the Cold War and peace that had broken out across Europe, it's 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 shocking to see the peace shattered in this in this way. And people who have joined us on previous podcasts they may remember that we've done two other episodes so far on the situation in Ukraine and Russia's war against it, as well as the international response and the bankruptcy of the foreign policy that has been uh, put forward towards Russia for many years. So as Ben was saying, there's a lot to talk about here. And on top of the loss of life and the human tragedy with particularly the immense number of refugees that you mentioned, Ben, we've already seen that there have been significant ramifications coming out of this war, and there are going to be many more. Naturally, we'll have more episodes uh, about the conflict in the time, in the days to come, weeks to come. Uh, today, we wanted to carve out one delimited aspect of, the, of this highly complex situation and talk about the issue of nationalism, because it's, it's become really salient, I think, in the way people think about the conflict. Uh, and I, I think w one interesting feature of this is that it connects to some deep philosophic issues, issues in the political philosophy. And I think, it, as you were suggesting um, before we had this, uh, before we went live, Ben, th there are really strong connections here to the debates about nationalism in America's cultural and intellectual life. And we want to get to that. Uh, but first, let's start with uh, sort of the main topic of nationalism. So. Uh, let me hand it off to you, Ben. 
Yeah, I mentioned at the top that there's there's some confusion, I think, especially on the political right about how to understand this conflict in terms of the ideology of nationalism. There's there's it, it sometimes it's it's put as well. There's good nationalism and there's bad nationalism. And the way that that comes up, especially in this case, is the bad nationalism is is obviously the kind that you see coming from Russia. It seems pretty obvious that a kind of Russian nationalism is responsible for this invasion in the first place. And you don't have to dig far to find out the Russian thinking on this subject. Uh, President Putin himself offered uh, a lengthy defense of his version and his vision of Russian nationalism in an article that he wrote and that was posted to uh, Russian government websites this past July. Uh, it wasn't discussed much at the time that it came out, but when you look back at what he wrote there, the whole vision for the war seems to be plotted out. He argues at some length and detail in the article that there is a historical uh, unity among Russians, Ukrainians, and Belarusians, uh, that they're all descended from the same ancient people, uh, the people who founded the kingdom of Kievan Rus, back in the ninth century. If you've studied uh, Russian history, indeed, that is usually cited as the uh, as the founding of the of the of the Slavic people and uh, contemporary Russia. Um, that's where the Russian Orthodox faith, the Russian Orthodox faith was founded. It's where uh, these are the peoples who were the uh, origins of the various Slavic languages. Uh, I'll quote a bit from this very lengthy article, and it's worth you can't find it on the Russian website, the Russian government website anymore because that site has gone down, but you can find it in the Internet Archive. And if you Google for on the historical unity of Russians and Ukrainians, you'll you'll see his detailed argumentation. He, he says in particular, the incorporation of the Western Russian lands into the single state was not merely the result of political and diplomatic decisions. It was underlain by the common faith, shared cultural traditions, and I would like to emphasize it once again, language similarity. And he explicitly repudiates the idea that Ukraine is a distinct nation with a distinct identity. He says that the whole reason that there was ever a border between Ukraine and Russia was, was because of accidents, geopolitical accidents that occurred during the founding and uh, sustenance of the Soviet Union, the beginning, the middle of the 20th century. Uh, and just as a, uh, perhaps as a, a, a sidebar on this issue, it's worth saying and you, the word Ukraine itself uh, in, in Slavic means, means periphery. It was the periphery of the Russian empire and part of the reason why Ukrainians today don't like it to be called the Ukraine and why they're insisting on Ukraine um, is because when you say the Ukraine, you're emphasizing how it is the periphery of, of Russia, which feeds the Russian nationalist idea. At the same time, uh, today's conservatives, especially in the United States, uh, who've, I think, felt some pressure uh, to side with the Ukrainians in this conflict, have also then been under pressure to characterize the Ukrainians fight as representative of the good nationalism, because nationalism is something that has been on the rise on the political right, that conservatives have started to champion, especially under the heading of what they call national conservatism. And uh, representative of this take on the issue, I think, is an article that came out in the National Review uh, just about last week uh, by Rich Lowry. And you can see from the title, the angle that he's going for here, that this the fight of the Ukrainians represents nationalism's finest hour. And I'll, I'll quote a few passages from Lowry's argument. He says, the fight to save Ukraine represents a righteous nationalism. The Ukrainians aren't defending democracy per se or freedom in the sense of abstract rights, although Vladimir Putin's Russia is a threat to both but their land and birthright. They are struggling for national self-determination and even national survival. Even, and here note this opposition, even in a globalized world, even when patriotism is not nearly as strong a force as it once was, even as Eurocrats who want to subsume Europe's nation in an EU superstate, Ukraine's struggle still strikes a profound chord. Zelensky was speaking a nationalist's language of love for his people's history, land and tradition. As G.K. Chesterton once wrote, cosmopolitanism gives us one country and it is good. Nationalism gives us a hundred countries and every one of them is the best. There were other conservatives who made similar 
arguments that the Ukrainians stand up for the best kind of nationalism. Uh, Dan Hannon in the Washington exa Examiner, Michael Barone in Real Clear Politics. And so I think what all of this raises is the question is, uh, is this conflict in Ukraine, is this really a story about nationalism at its best uh, on the side of the Ukrainians, or is it nationalism at its worst on the side of the Russians doing the invasion? And I don't think we are going to be able to figure this out unless we think a little more clearly about what nationalism really is. And what's the concept mean here? What do we need it for? So Ben, I think it would be useful to put uh, some philosophic context here and help people see where we're coming from. And I find uh, Ayn Rand's comment on this subject really clarifying. And so she was asked a question about what is the value of nationalism after one of her lectures in 1967. And I want to share that with you uh, all so we can unpack some of her thinking about this, because I, I think there's a lot here to gain from. So in answer to the question, she says, what is the value of nationalism? That depends on how you interpret the term. Nationalism as a primary, that is, the attitude of my country, right or wrong, without any judgment, is chauvinism, a blind, collectivist, racist feeling for your own country, merely because you were born there. In that sense, nationalism is very wrong. But nationalism properly understood as a man's devotion to his country because of an approval of its basic premises, principles, and social system, as well as its culture, is the common bond among men and that nation. It is a commonly understood culture and an affection for it that permits a society of men to live together peacefully. But a country and its system must earn this approval. It must be worthy of that kind of devotion. End quote. And I just want to amplify that last point because I think this is crucial in today's intellectual climate where this perspective, number one, is not really understood. And number two, it, th this particular aspect that I want to highlight, I think is really important to distinguish how Ayn Rand thinks about this and how one, I think one should think about this issue in contrast to the way a lot of people view it. And that's the, it's in the words, a country and its system must earn this approval. It must be worthy of this kind of devotion. And just to draw out the point, the, the idea here, I think, is that what I take from this is that people of a country should judge and rationally evaluate the character of that country. And there should be some identifiable basis, some legitimate, conceptualizable value underpinning such loyalty. And this is not, and this is in contrast with the way I think a lot of people, even people who have, who are fastening on to good aspects of their uh, country and, and are loyal to it. I think even there, I think this this piece is missing. It's not simply because of the accident of where you happen to be born or grew up that you are attached to a country. There has to be some identifiable uh, value that you're that you see and that you embrace, and and not because of tradition or something ulterior uh, in, in what your reaction is based on. So I think that's really crucial. I think when you look at that, that quote by Ayn Rand, you might be, uh, it might be a little easy to come to the conclusion, well, the conservatives who are saying that the Ukrainians are representatives of nationalism, that they're talking about nationalism in the good sense that Ayn Rand is speaking there, the way she put it was nationalism properly understood, the kind that you say has to be earned. But I think if you look at what they've actually written, it's not obvious that that's what they're talking about, that they're, if anything, trying to run these two together. And you saw that in, for instance, that quotation I read from Lowry, because he says they're not standing up for freedom per se, or any kind of abstract rights, but for their land and their birthright. Now that's, that's more on the side of the, of the kind of chauvin racist chauvinism that Ayn Rand was talking about. And I think when you, especially when you look at their theorists, at, at, the, at the conservative intellectuals who really made a case positively for nationalism as an important intellectual force behind the conservative movement, this becomes even clearer and here I have in mind uh, the, the work of uh, Yoram Hazoni, who uh, wrote a book, The Virtue of Nationalism. 
Elon, you wrote uh, a review of this book uh, some months ago, and we'll share with our viewers uh, how to find that review later. But it's worth digging into kind of the theoreticians here because they, I think, make clear that they really are trying to run these two kinds of nationalism together, and that's part of the problem. So, for instance, on the one hand, Hazoni says in this book, the nationalism I grew up with is a principled standpoint that regards the world as governed best when nations are able to chart their own independent course, cultivating their own traditions and pursuing their own interests without interference. This is opposed to imperialism, which seeks to bring peace and prosperity to the world by uniting mankind as much as possible under a single political regime. Now, at first blush, I think that sounds like the better kind of nationalism insofar as he's saying, well, it's best that nations be able to chart their own independent course, but you see the smuggling in of the other version of nationalism, even here where he makes reference to what they're trying to do in charting their own course is cultivating their own traditions. Uh, and that's something he expands on at greater length in the book, where he talks about in a, in a and I'll shortly show that, uh, Another clue is how he goes on to distinguish, I mean, he, he distinguishes kind of his kind of nationalism from imperialism, which makes sense at first, but uh, he then assimilates imperialism to the kind of globalism uh, of the European Union and even of the Pax Americana of the United States, which he considers to be a kind of imperialism. I think there's a lot of flaws with the way the European Union is run. And there's certainly been flaws with something like United States foreign policy, but to regard the mere fact that there's a projection of power uh, globally and an interest in expanding certain kinds of things like free trade uh, and peace under the under the banner and leadership of America, to call that imperialism is is a is a bridge too far in my view, and for reasons that I think will become clear. It especially becomes clear when you look at what he thinks is wrong with globalism. It's not that it represents the spread of um, collectivist institutions around the world uh, under the leadership of people like the EU. It's it's rather the opposite. Uh, here's what he says about what's wrong with globalism. He says, much of what takes place in political life is motivated by concerns such as families, tribes, and nations. Human beings are born into such collectives or adopt them later in life and are tied to them by powerful bonds of mutual loyalty among their members. In fact, we come to regard these collectives as an integral part of ourselves. Many, if not most, political aims are derived from responsibilities or duties that we feel we have, not to ourselves as individuals, but to an extended self that incorporates our family, tribe, or nation. And so when he tries to, when he gives a model of what he regards as sort of a para, uh, a paragon of the nationalism that he supports, which involves unifying under a single state the people of a nation who are joined by the kinds of bonds of family, tribe, uh, and birth that I just mentioned. He doesn't cite as his best example something like Enlightenment philosophers and the nation states of the mo early modern period. He cites the ancient Israelites because they allegedly sought to unify different tribes on, with sharing a common language and religion under a single state, which to me is a telling example. This is not the nation state of modernity. This is the, this is the nation state of, of an ancient primitive people. And this is very different from uh, the kind of good nationalism that it, it, it seems like the Ukrainians are standing for. That's especially when Hazoni and many of these other national conservatives uh, celebrate nationalism usually in opposition to individualism. And that's part of the reason why they regard the EU and the, and the United States as imperialistic, because these are political forces that stand for Western liberalism, which is seen as liberating the individual. Uh, and they think that has abandoned the reverence for tradition and tribe and family of the ancient world. So it really is a very regressive viewpoint. Uh, they, Hazoni will pay lip service to the values of individualism and individual freedom. Uh, I think he has to in the kind of context where he's speaking, but 
the way he does it is to say, well, the reason why these are valuable is they're part of the Western tradition. His primacy, that he attaches primacy to tradition. And one implication of that is that he'll say, yes, the West values individual freedom as part of its tradition, but maybe other parts of the world don't, and they can't be expected uh, to form their political systems around that idea. And that's part of the reason that he then regards uh, the United States as imperialistic, because it wants to spread Western individualism around the world. And he sees that as intrusive and, and as imperialistic. Ben, I, I know you started reading the book and we talked a little bit about this. One of the things I would tell people about Hazoni's approach, and I have a lot of, um, I don't know, anger, I guess is the right term, uh, about this. Uh, there's something really wrong with an argument that tells you America is in the category of imperialism along with the Nazis. And the Nazis were not nationalist, despite being national socialists, despite all the rhetoric you can find in reams and reams of speeches by, by Nazi leaders. And, and what, part of what happens, if you, the more you dig into Hazoni, who I think it's important to stress is, the, is one of the prime movers behind this, move, this strain of conservatism that puts emphasis on national identity and nationalism. The, rejection of individualism as understood in the Enlightenment and since then as embodied in the American system of government, the rejection of that is profound. It goes all the way down, I think, to deep philosophic disagreements about the nature of hu what human beings are and what they're capable of doing. And there, it, the role he gives to individualism, I, I've heard him talk, he, he was in a debate with our colleague Yaron Brook recently, and he is eager to tell people that he thinks there's a place for valuing individuals in society. And in, in the book, however, when you really understand the logic of his position, that is at best a disguise or a facade or a, a way, a sugarcoating for what this idea really means. And it, it puts all the primary, it put primacy on the group. So you, you, you mentioned that he thinks some societies will recognize the individual, some won't, and it really is up to them based on their traditions. Or, and really that means, no, there's no principle here that we recognize. There's the idea of a government being shaped by the goal of protecting individuals' freedom, that is, has no place in his conception. That might happen in some cultures, it might not, and who are we to say there are no universal values in his mind, except, of course, the idea that nations should be primary. There's a lot, we, we could have a whole conversation about how profound the rejection of individualism is here. Uh, and I think it's, it's crucial to see that, the, to, to your point about how this is blending together two conceptions or two perspectives on nationalism into what I, I think Ayn Rand would call a package deal. So it's, it's non-essential similarities and or, or, or crucial differences being uh, papered over. I think it, this is, a, it, it, it really corrupts thinking when you approach things this way. And I think the movement of which Hazoni and others are, are a part of is actively trying to do that. I think it's trying to mislead people into understanding or misunderstanding what nationalism really looks like. Yeah, it, and I think, I think you're right to see what's going on here as a as a kind of package deal, and it's it's a package deal that needs to be really forcefully broken up in people's understanding, and I'll I'll recommend a way to do that. But it's to see why it's so important to separate these two very different ideas. It's important to see why one of them is wrong, why the chauvinistic, racist kind of nationalism that Ayn Rand spoke of is wrong. And I think the reasons why it's wrong help show why Hazoni is wrong and why Putin is wrong and that they're really in the same bed together. And that's a big mistake. Um, you don't have any moral obligations that flow simply by virtue of your blood relations to your family. Uh, if you have abusive parents who don't who don't take care of you well, who don't raise you well, you there's no loyalty to them whatsoever. You should you should leave the family, you should break free 
and and find your own way in life. And incidentally, I think it's that's even true the other way around. It's true that a child doesn't uh, isn't born uh, of its own will, and so because of that, parents who choose to have children have obligations to them by virtue of that choice. But if a child becomes abusive, like if a child starts uh, striking out its parents and using violence, parents can uh, decide, no, we need to give this kid uh, up to the uh, up for adoption or up to the state uh, or it's they don't have an unconditional obligation if a child is abusive to the parents even. So there, there's simply no obligation that arises simply from blood ties. And at various points, Sazoni is at pains to say that, well, his view is not racist, that he he's still against racism and various connections between nationalism and racism are spurious. But if you think about what a race is actually even supposed to be, it is just an extended set of blood ties. It's an extended family. Ayn Rand at one point regarded family worship as uh, the idea that you have unconditional ties to your family and your ancestors as a form of mini racism, um, because there's really nothing different in principle distinguishing the two from each other. It might be true, as Hazoni indicates in his book, that, that most modern nations arose out of tribal and, and uh, ties and attempts to unify tribes in the way that he uh, thinks is appropriate. But the fact that this is how historically it occurred doesn't provide any kind of evidence for the way things ought to be. I take it that part of what moral progress consists in is elevating ourselves beyond our tribal history and, uh, and, and reforming our institutions along lines that allow for greater privacy, that allow for greater protection of the individual. Um, and so then to the point about why is the protection of the individual so important, Hazoni says, well, this is just our Western tradition and different countries have different traditions. But in fact, there is a universal objective need that human beings have for freedom, regardless of which tribe they come from. They don't all recognize this need and they don't all want to implement it. And that's part of the reason why there are different traditions. But it's true about, it's a fact about human nature that we survive uh, by our rational minds, that, our, that we need freedom to use our minds, to think and produce in order to live a distinctively human life. And whatever effort you take to spread freedom around the world, uh, if it's done consistent with that value, is not any kind of imperialism. It's, it's, it's working to overthrow oppressive tyrannies. I don't think that means the United States needs to be a policeman that goes around the world uh, uh, knocking over different autocratic regimes. But when countries have cultures that adopt freedom on their own, uh, even if it means breaking with tradition, that's a good thing. Uh, and the traditions that they are opposing are bad. Uh, for that reason. And I think it's true that nation states are, are good tools for protecting freedom, uh, seen from that perspective, but that's, that's because they are needed to protect a nation from other nations that don't respect freedom uh, and, and from attempts to unify people along the lines of empires that are opposed to freedom too. So some kind of a global tyranny would be a bad thing. You wouldn't have the ability to leave your country and go to a better one. But uh, that's a very different conception of what's valuable about the nation state than I think what conservatives like Hazoni are talking about. And so we really need to unpackage these two kinds of nationalism. Uh, my own preference is to not even call the, the kind that is con consonant with and protective of individual rights nationalism. I, I call it rational patriotism, just because there's so much confusion about what nationalism actually is. And you, can, you, could call, you could say there's good nationalism and bad nationalism, but then I think you need to be really clear about what you mean by the good nationalism and that it's not anything like what Hazoni or Lowry are talking about. So 
Elon, we should probably now uh, uh, turn back to the question of Ukraine. We've, we've spent some time discussing the, uh, the theoretical issue here, but it's worth seeing, well, given the understanding of nationalism that a lot of these commentators are working with, uh, who's, which side is the real nationalism, which side is, is, the, is the phony nationalism? And at least if we're to take someone like Kazoni and his case for nationalism as, as representative of a real intellectual current uh, and, a, and, a, and a genuine representative of an influential form of nationalism, I think if you look at the kinds of reasons that he gives for why he thinks nationalism is important, and if you take those reasons really seriously, it's, it, it really does look like it would justify something like Putin's war and nothing like the defense that the Ukrainians are mounting. And that's in spite of the fact that I know Hazoni claims himself to be on the side of Ukraine. It's true that Ukraine really does have strong historical, religious, and linguistic ties to Russia. The, the history that, uh, that Putin cites is accurate. Uh, there's, of course, there have been changing boundaries and borders across Eastern Europe for hundreds of years, but um, that's true about ancient Palestine as well, and any any nation that you want to cite. So, I mean, especially if you if you if his model is something like ancient Israel, is it is it really that implausible to expect that you know King David probably engaged in wars of conquest against the Philistines and the Amorites because he claimed that uh, he they were on land that was traditionally associated with various is, Israelite tribes. How is Putin any worse than that? So if someone like Kazoni says, well, individual freedom is important, but it's only important because it's the tradition of a country and it's not when it isn't. I mean, individual freedom isn't a big part of the tradition of Russia. And so if they see their uh, comrades, uh, their Russian speaking comrades on the ground being quote unquote, occupied and oppressed by Westerners, uh, and they see the government of Ukraine as having been captured by Western ideas, why wouldn't nationalist ideas justify that kind of war? Uh, let's not forget that this war arose in part because, in large part, because the Ukrainians wanted to join Western institutions. They wanted to join NATO, and they now want to join the EU. And these are the very entities that that Hazoni regards as imperialistic. So if if Putin is invading Ukraine, by Hazoni's logic, it would seem Putin is liberating Ukrainians from the imperialist yoke of the West. It's really hard to see why his view of things wouldn't justify the very war that we're looking at. I agree with that, Ben. I would I just wanna to add to that with just to pull out a thread from Hazoni's view, which is that his concept of what nationalism is amounts to a, a many la layered uh, tribe, basically. Small tribes, it starts with families, it goes to clans and tribes and so forth, and then it becomes a nation. And what he's reluctant to admit, I think, fully is that it is essentially a collectivist view. And that's essential to what he's, he's arguing for, where the individual has really no place, no protection on principle. And by rejecting the principle of individual rights as a universal idea that should govern all societies, what Hazoni leaves open, and I think all collectivist forms of nationalism, if we think of them that way, well, what they all manifest in some form is a, is a kind of statist government because there is no limit to what the government can demand of you. If the collective says, well, this is what we need. We need, you, we need to conscript you. We need you. We need your house. We need whatever it is that the nation sees itself as needing. There is no barrier possible to that except, well, you can in, invoke some tradition, but the tradition is not an ironclad guide and there's certainly no principle such as the individual rights to protect you. What you get is these governments that then see their people as pawns, which I think is exactly the way that Putin sees Russians. 
He's sending them into this war. A lot of the soldiers, as we've seen from news reports, they don't know why they're there. They were sent for training maneuvers and, and war games, and suddenly they're invading another country. They're not motivated to do that. They don't see any particular reason for them to be there. I think that's a, a common view among them from what we can glean. And this is Putin saying, well, no, the nation needs its soldiers to go die on the streets of Kiev and to die in the, on, the, on the farmlands of Ukraine because this is what Mother Russia needs. So, and there's nothing Russians can say to oppose that. Well, what are they going to invoke? The nation comes above the individual. That's the principle that Hazoni advocates and what Putin actually uh, implements. And when you get this connection, when you understand this is a, a, an identification Ayn Rand makes in an essay called The Roots of War, which is that statism, the idea that the state comes uh, bef- above the individual, it, it, it's, a, it's a, I think, intimately connected to collectivism. When the state comes above the individual and decides and treats the individual's life as something to be disposed of, this is the engine of war. This is what leads to conflict armed conflict in various kinds, both internal internal to a country and between countries and among countries. This is a big hole in Hazoni's perspective, and I think of a lot of nationalists, which is he doesn't want to admit that this is that tribes and collectives and nations, because they subordinate the individual, they don't protect the individual's freedom, this is where what uh, enables and and motivates conf- wars and conflicts of various kinds. So to me, it's not even a question, is Putin following and justifying his actions in, in nationalist terms? Is that co- consistent with what has been? I think it's it's very clearly is, as you were arguing, Ben. A- and this is, the, this is what makes nationalism so deadly, because if you have rational loyalty to your country, that's not going to lead you on your fellow compatriots to invade another country. I mean, that's the initiation of force. If you're not uh, threatened by them, there's no reason to do that. The only reason you might go to war is in self-defense. And that is certainly not what Putin is doing. That's the opposite of what he's doing. He's initiating force against Ukraine on a, on a barbaric scale that I think has shocked people. But that's exactly what happens on this idea of the nation coming above the individual, the individual being subordinate to the group, and there being absolutely no principled commitment to freedom. And and that's really inherent, I think, in that form of nationalism that we've been uh, inveighing against throughout this conversation. One of the reasons why I think it's important to not even talk about good nationalism versus bad nationalism is because bringing even to talk about the good kind of nationalism it makes it far too ambiguous that what you stand for is individualism as opposed to collectivism and i think it's really important to emphasize that the fundamental alternative here is individualism versus collectivism not what hazoni says which is nationalism versus imperialism where that's really putting it into terms of two competing kinds of collectivism and just to illustrate that a bit i think one response Zoni himself might give to what we're saying today is that, well, Russia isn't nationalistic because they're imperialistic. And that's why the, the real Ukrainians, the, the real nationalists are the Ukrainians. Uh, and it's true that there's a, there historically was a Russian empire that conquered many different peoples from arguably many different linguistic and religious backgrounds. Um, but that doesn't really change anything about what's going on right now in Ukraine, because the Ukrainians are not from a different religious and linguistic background. And there's a there's a stronger claim uh, for a historical national unity there than there was for uh, the, the other peoples that were conquered by the Russians. Like maybe Hazoni would be right that Russia was being an empire with respect to uh, the Turkic peoples of Central Asia and Siberia and so forth, but it's c- kind of immaterial to the current conflict. And in any case, uh, to think of the fundamental alternative as between nationalism versus imperialism, run it makes it very difficult to see how different something like Russia is from the United States. 
Hazoni sees the United States as imperialistic, and it's it, uh, at least in its current approach to the world. But you would have to not just look at the current U.S. geopolitical situation, but mostly the whole history of the U.S. in the same terms on his premises, because it's simply not the case that like the lower 48 states of the United States encompass a geographical territory that that does anything like unify a a, a distinctive uh, set of peoples who have a common language and religion. I mean, half of the United States used to be part of Mexico and Spanish and English are very different languages. And there's an incredible variety of religious groups who live in the United States. It's a nation of immigrants. Uh, and as such a nation, it's nothing like the kind of nation that Hazoni thinks deserves unity. And so it's, I think, not a big surprise that he's pushed in the direction of saying it has to be some kind of empire. But to put the U.S. and the quote unquote U.S. empire in the same category as the Russian empire is a perverse thing to say when they are clearly different when you categorize them as individualism versus collectivism. Russia's empire was collectivistic from the start. And I'm not just talking about the, the Soviet Union. I mean the, the original Russian empire under the czars, uh, which was you know, founded on the idea that the Russian people, the Orthodox faith and the Slavic language uh, had a special distinctive significance to it. And that's completely the opposite from the United States, which was founded as a nation of the enlightenment uh, under the conception that the individual should be able to govern his own life and that the state was merely a servant. And it's true that this was initially championed by people of the Anglo-Saxon persuasion. Uh, but I think if you look at the way that that idea has been transferred down through the years, it's, 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 it's now one that is championed by people from many different religious and linguistic backgrounds. And they have something in common above all of those differences that this nation represents. And to put it together with the Russians is, is ridiculous. I just want to add a couple of points, Ben. Um, so one, you know, Hazoni is going to listen to this, so maybe he's going to come back to us with an objection. You're not representing my view fairly, and and you know, we'll we're doing our best. And but one thing that he does to make his position seem credible on this idea that America is an is imperialistic, he mentions American foreign policy in the Middle East, which the, the whole Bush crusade, George W. Bush crusade to bring democracy to, to Iraq and Afghanistan. And, and, and that's part of his evidence that America has this imperialistic approach. And, and that what he's objecting to is the idea that we had the audacity to think that freedom, as the Bush administration claimed it was advocating, that we think freedom is a universal value. Well, I, I, we've been critiquing American foreign policy for two decades, and particularly the Bush administration. And what America did in the Middle East is un-American. The whole idea of going to another country and bringing them elections, we have been, we've savaged that policy as self-sacrificial and un-American precisely because it doesn't take seriously the lives of American soldiers and Americans here. It doesn't advance American security. So that even that uh, that shred of seeming evidence that he would offer, I think, is is not evidence that America is imperialistic. It, it's, it's the contrary. It's America at its worst in terms of foreign policy. And you can't point to America when it's making mistakes and, and deviating from its principles and saying that's the essential nature of this country. That is just not credible. And then on the issue of nationalism, I just wanted to clarify for everyone listening my view is not the, is not that every Ukrainian who is outraged by Putin and they they all are entitled to be outraged is is and wants to fight back. I, my claim is not that they're all doing it from a a fully clear conception of of nationalism in in the form let's not call it nationalism but of rational patriotism. I think most of them are. I think that is, it's natural to want to protect your life, your, your job, your family, everything around you that's being blown up to pieces and, and turned to rubble. It, it's completely rational to want to fight back against that invasion. And I think for the most part, what I've seen, the evidence is they are reacting from the right 
motivations and the right premises. I'm not, I, my point is that we can't discount there being some people who are acting from a kind of tribal traditional perspective on what they're defending now. But I think that's a marginal thing. I don't think that tells you one way or the other what it is, how to evaluate what the Ukrainians are doing. Because I think it's really, it's admirable and it, it certainly deserves uh, support and moral endorsement for sure. And just to wind this point down, and, and I want to set up another issue that I think is worth talking about as we kind of wind down. We've been at pains to unpack this idea of nationalism that people like Hazoni and Lowry in particular, because Lowry has a whole book on nationalism too. They are working to confuse people by peddling this package deal, this, this merging of very different ideas. Nationalism as, as rooted in tradition and tribe and collective with what most sort of rational people would say is a, a reasonable devotion to the values of your country that are defensible, they have some basis in value, and they've fused them in a way that really clouds people's thinking. And I think we've shown some of the evidence for that, where Hazoni is really pulled in both directions. His logic would justify what Putin's doing, but he still thinks he's on the side of the Ukrainian, which is just completely incoherent. One of the lessons, I think, in, in, in this a debate to draw out is that, and this is a point Ayn Rand made in many places, is that how we think about the world is really important and it's a philosophic issue, that there's an incredible value in having clarity about the, the concepts we use, the ideas we use, and this is not about definitions and, 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 and um, looking things up in the dictionary, this is about asking the question, what are the facts in reality that give rise to a concept? Is it a valid concept? The whole idea that concepts can be valid or invalid, I think that's really distinctive to Ayn Rand. And that there are uh, known ways in which people go wrong when they try to conceptualize things. And one of them we've been talking about here at length, the idea of a package deal where you take, it's a, it's a wrong kind of conception and it really harms your thinking. And I think the, it, part of the what to take from this conversation in how to unpack the Ukraine situation, the arguments around nationalism is, this is, I think, one more affirmation of the, the guidance that Ayn Rand gives you, which is be really jealous of what ideas you accept. Really be critical and diligent in evaluating, why, what is this idea? Do I really believe it? What's the basis for it? Is it? Does it capture something in the world that needs to be captured by an idea? Or am I, is it a grab bag of different things that don't belong together and it's actually going to be not a helpful tool for my thinking, but it's going to stymie my thinking? Uh, and, and one of the wonderful places where she talks about the, the importance of being critical about what ideas you accept and being explicit about them. I mean, the two come to mind. I'm sure there's many more we can mention. One is philosophy who needs it about the importance of being self-critical about the ideas one accepts. The other one is philosophical detection, which I think is where she gives some advice on how to examine ideas one encounters. But to me, this is another object lesson in the value of really being philosophical about one's knowledge and, and being, uh, evaluating it and, and uh, knowing how to navigate what sort of the debates that you encounter in the world. And Elon, the, the value here, I take it, is, is not simply with regard to understanding debates about foreign policy, because, of course, uh, nationalism is very much in play uh, on the domestic political scene in the United States. And, and even though Hazoni is himself from Israel, he's become a kind of leader of the U.S. national conservative movement. They have conferences. He speaks at them all the time. So it strikes me that this is an opportunity to reflect on what's wrong with nationalism in the United States and the way that it's entered the political dialogue here. Do you have thoughts on this? Yeah, I think this, this would be good to have another conversation about another in-depth analysis of this phenomenon. It's something I'm reading about and researching. A couple of observations, and my view is that this whole enterprise, this national conservatism, or the, the push for nationalism, and it's coming particularly from many conservatives, the different strains of it. My view is that it is cashing in on a virtue that Ameri many Americans have, which is they do in some form have rational loyalty to the values of America. They 
they value their own freedom, they value the opportunity that that leads to economically and the, the quality of life that you can have in a free society and all the innovation and so forth. I think there's a very strong positive reaction to that. What's missing and what makes people vulnerable to the nationalist narrative that we hear from people like Rich Lowry and, and Hazoni and, and, all the and many of the speakers that they invite to their events is that absent a really solid conceptual understanding of what America's actual character is, what it stands for, what are the principles, the philosophic foundations of America. And as you were saying earlier, Ben, it is a, an enlightenment country. It's, the, it's a child of the enlightenment. We are the heirs of a brilliant intellectual tradition where America is essentially, its founding is essentially on an individualist perspective. And that is shaped uh, the, the kind of government we have in its original conception. Now, there's a lot of flaws in what arose throughout history, notably slavery and, and inconsistencies, but essentially America is an individualist society. But I think that conception of America has really, it, it, you, it'd be hard to find people who can articulate that. And if you can't articulate it, then you're vulnerable to the kind of confusing package deal that it, this movement is pushing, which is, well, what's good about America is the traditions and the flag and the, and the eagle, and we're all Anglo-Saxons originally, never mind that that's not even true, and this is what unites us. This is, we're a nation, just like the nations of Europe, and that is the core of who we are. Let's all stand for the anthem. But that is, to me, that is a caricature a caricature, and that's even being charitable, of what America really means. It's, it's a unique country in history because it's, it's grounded in a philosophic revolution and it's the product of that. And to think that it's, you can capture it with these concrete aspects that are at best non-essential. Like we could have a different flag. <laughs> we could have a different anthem. We could have a different geography. None of those things are essential to what is valuable about America and what deserves our loyalty and devotion, what we should be fighting to, to bring greater clarity to and support. And those are the philosophic principles at the core of the American system, which is, I think, paramount among those is individualism. And to me, the, the part of the tragedy of this debate as it occurs in the United States is that as the national the people pushing nationalism make inroads, it's they're making inroads to the extent and, and mainly because Americans have lost real understanding and appreciation for what America is conceptually. Like it's uh, to me, if you ask a lot of people what it would be, you would get some, some floating ideas that are not anchored in any particular data, some out of context symbols like the flag or, or th and some memories and things like that, which are not conceptually solid. And I think as a result of that, people are vulnerable to confusions and to being sucked into this irrational uh, perspective, which is we're calling nationalism. And I think if you, if you take this a step further, what would it look like if the nationalist idea that Hazoni and Lowry and so many others are pushing. What does that look like in America? Does it mean that America becomes more true to its original enlightenment vision, which is what I would like to see happen? Is it America becomes better at protecting individual rights and, and freedom? No, that's exactly the opposite of what would happen. What you would get is a move towards authoritarianism, a, a, a more explicit repudiation of individualism, and we would then be even more vulnerable to their arising some charismatic leader who knows how to what to do with knows exactly what Putin's doing. He's going to pick up the Putin playbook or the the Orban playbook from Hungary and turn the country more towards this collectivist vision. And I think that is how America just really starts on the accelerating its downward motion. And it would not surprise me if we move towards an authoritarian kind of government, because then the principle that's governing this society is not the individual's freedom is protected by the state, which is it's ser the servant of individuals. It's that, the, well, we're serving the nation, and that's the primary. And well, why not uh, sacrifice individuals in wars? And why not sacrifice them because the nation demands it? And I think that is the path towards America truly becoming a, a uh, authoritarian nationalist uh, state, which would be a, I mean, the monumental tragedy, I think. Yeah, I think the, 
the best argument that you used to be able to give for why, let's say, conservatives were uh, are preferable to elect to office than your than the Democrats or the progressives was at least the conservatives still uh, maintained some kind of respect for the founding principles of uh, of the United States that they were more individualistic and less collectivistic. But this trend that you now see uh, toward nationalism uh, in the conservative movement, which has really been welcomed with open arms and has faced little opposition, uh, is probably the biggest counterpoint to that today, that, that there's anything like that. I mean, there are still some better conservatives who I think still understand the the, the American project as an enlightenment project, but they're, they're fewer than they used to be. They're less vocal, they're less powerful. Even many of the conservative organs that have been anti-Trump uh, still go in for this kind of nationalism. That uh, article from Rich Lowry is from the National Review. The National Review has been very anti-Trump, but still they're okay with embracing this kind of national conservatism. And that's, I think, very concerning leaving uh, very few more rational conservatives left uh, to speak up against this tide of collectivism in their own movement. Elon, we've got a few minutes left, and I, I see at least a couple of questions that have come in that are probably worth addressing. Should we go to that? Yeah, and let me just say thanks to those of you who are submitting uh, donations through Super Chat. We appreciate it. And in general, when people submit questions with Super Chat, we try to give those priority, and we, we don't always succeed. So I just want to make people aware of how we approach that. But yeah, why don't you tell, tell me which question you want to take on first? Well, the first one that is on our list is actually relevant to what we were just discussing. I wonder if you have thoughts on this. In American politics, how should we treat politicians who continued to support Russia? after the Russian invasion began, even if they have since changed their public position. I think I know who this person might be talking about, but do you have thoughts, Elon? I mean, I can think of some of the politicians who were pro-Putin before and have changed their tune somewhat, and we'll see what happens when the war ends. I think you have to take that very seriously. It, to me, this is their change of tune is not, it's hard to believe, it's heartfelt. Uh, and that it's, to me, it's, they were, what's important for me is that they spent so much time boosting Putin and, and making him seem credible and, and whitewashing his reputation. All of that means that they helped pave the way for this kind of crisis where Putin feels, well, this is what they're saying about me. I'm a great guy. I'm savvy. I'm brilliant. I'm a great tactician. Well, and, and the way various politicians have treated Putin over the years, well, that, how could you be surprised that he feels em emboldened to invade another country again, which is not is obviously not the first time he's done it. So to me, there's a complicity here. I think there's some responsibility that you can't just undo by saying, yeah, oh, now we, now, we, now we recognize that Putin's a problem and how dare he invade. Think back to what has been said before. And one thing I would add in response to this question is that I do think it shows that the political currents that are prominent in our culture are not entirely the product of, of what the politicians say, that many politicians change with the wind. And so there's been a lot of speculation with, uh, a lot of speculation about, is the current direction of the conservative movement a result of Trump's rhetoric. And there's I think, ways in which it has been, but I think there's also ways in which Trump was picking up on uh, something in the spirit of the of the culture that was that was itself on an ascendancy independent of him, and that he jumped on that bandwagon and, and profited from it. And what I think this shows is that the American uh, people who have been, I think, f f predominant majority of them have been in support of Ukraine, are not so far gone uh, from original founding principles of America as to go in all the way for the nationalism that they've been flirting with. And so that there's still some hope. I mean, this has been, a, I think, a rare moment of unity 
uh, for people on the left and the right in the United States to see that what's going on in Ukraine is bad and that Putin is evil. And so it's, a, it's an opportunity uh, to try to uh, dissolve some of the political tribalism that, that has been happening in this country where, uh, where conservatives in particular have been manipulated by nationalist intellectuals to, you know, by means of this package deal that you've, you've been uh, emphasizing rightly, Elon, that, that some element, of, they have some element of pride in their country for the right reasons and that they've been pulled over into the nationalist camp by the intellectuals. But this kind of uh, controversy, I think, shows that, that they're not quite willing to go all that way just yet. And so that there's, there's some hope and it's an opportunity for people like us, I think, to speak up and to try to unpackage that package deal for them and, uh, and show them how their tribalistic behavior has been blinding them to some of the things they themselves think are true. Another one of the questions that came up, uh, we talked a bit about Hazoni's view of Israeli history. Uh, one person asks on YouTube, does Israel equal good nationalism? And another asks, why is nationalism wrong? Is Israel is an ethno-nationalist state. Uh, I was myself suggesting that it was uh, inauspicious for Hazoni to champion the idea of ancient Israel as his model of a, of a, of a just polity. But Ilan, wouldn't you say there's a difference between ancient Israel and modern Israel in this respect? Yes, for sure. And I, my view of Israel is that it has both elements and both are quite pronounced and they're at war with each other. It has a nationalist element in, a, in terms of what we're describing as a collectivist conception. And it has an, uh, a strong element of individualism in the sense that it, it does protect freedom. There, it, there is a government that's designed with that purpose in mind. Both of these are active. I think they color people's attitude to their country because it is a country where I think it's, I don't think it's unique, but it, there really is a strong sense of loyalty to the country that's genuine. But there's also bad kind of loyalty, which is, well, it's our country and, and right or wrong. So both are there, and I think my view is that the, the, it is the individualist elements that are at the root of the virtue of that country, the extent that it protects individual and protects, to the extent that it is individualistic in, its, in aspects of its culture, those are the, the sources of its strength. So it, it's innovative in technology, it's innovative in, in various business areas and science and so forth. And I think that comes from there being the ability to pursue knowledge and the freedom to do so. And there are really bad elements that manifest in Israel as well, which are very strong nationalism, including racist uh, groups and factions that I think flow out of that whole collectivist perspective. So, my, I, and Hazoni talks about this in his book, which is, if people are interested, they could take a look at the article I wrote that responds to that, because he does point to Israel as, a, as an example, contemporary Israel as an example of nationalism of the kind he thinks is good. And in my view is, well, the good aspects are not the result of tribalism. They're there despite tribalism and they're there as a result of whatever amount of individualism there still is in the country. I don't have anything to add to that. Uh, there was one more question that at first I didn't think was was quite relevant enough to our topic, but then I thought of a way in which it is uh, and this is the question, why is the Ukrainian government demanding that men fight against Russia? Shouldn't people choose to fight or not? And I think the reason this is relevant is because, well, first, I just I, I think it is important to make clear. Yeah, from what I've read, uh, the uh, Ukrainian government is, is conscripting many of its soldiers. There are men who are trying to flee to the West who are not being allowed to cross over into Poland because they're being conscripted into the army. And I think it's worth saying that's wrong. That's collectivistic. It's a violation of individual rights. Uh, at the same time, um, it's of course, conscription is almost universal practice in the West, uh, even in the United States. I, I had to sign up for the selective service when I turned 18. Fortunately, it's never been exercised since Vietnam. But uh, also at the same time, I think it's hard to see what's happening on the ground in this war 
as a battle between two armies that are equally full of conscripts. I don't think that the Russians would have faced as many setbacks as they have so far if at least, you know, most of the Ukrainians who are fighting didn't want to be doing it. There's, there's, there, there's too much willpower on the part of the Ukrainian troops to want to fight off the Russians to make sense of their lack of progress. There have been too many stories of Russian conscripts who don't know why they're there, who don't care why they're there. That's why they're not very good at it. And too many stories of, uh, uh, of Ukrainians joining up to fight in this battle. Not only that, of, of, of Westerners who aren't Ukrainians uh, traveling to Ukraine to, to fight on behalf of this country because they see it as a, a fight for the freedom of Europe uh, as opposed to uh, the Russians. So yeah, there's definitely an element of, and I think this speaks to what you were saying before, Ilan, about how you know, Ukraine is not a paragon of individualism. It's, there's certainly many imperfections, many kinds of corruption, uh, many aspects of statism, even in their own approach. But there is still, I think, a really big difference. Um, between the Ukrainians and the Russians, and, and and the fact that this was a war that started over the 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 fact that the majority of Ukrainians wanted to become closer to the West and to its liberal institutions is really significant. You can't just brush that aside. Well, should we start to wrap up? I think um, let's let's start by letting people know that right after this podcast, we will have a clubhouse session. I will be there. I don't think Elon can make it, but uh, my colleague Dan Schwartz and I will lead a discussion of some of the topics that we've been discussing today. So please look up the Ayn Rand Club on Clubhouse and we will start that session just as soon as we end this one. Uh, also like to let you know about some resources that you can take a look at to learn more about some of the issues that we discussed today. So we've talked about Ayn Rand's uh, criticism of the bad kind of nationalism, which I think is the essence of what today's nationalism is. And if you'd like to learn more about her reasons for rejecting the kind of tribalism that Hazoni stands for, for instance, best place to look is her essay, Global Balkanization, which was published in her book, The Voice of Reason, uh, but which is also on our website at bit.ly slash globalbalk all one word, lowercase. Also, Elon has published a number of very relevant pieces on things we've talked about today. He wrote a commentary on Hazoni's book, uh, a, which he, he called The Vice of Nationalism in opposition to Hazoni's view that it's the virtue of nationalism. You can read this at bit.ly, Vice of Nationalism. And also, uh, we talked a bit about how nationalism has been influencing contemporary US politics. Elon also wrote a piece on this for New Ideal called The Threat of National Conservatism. And you can read that at bit.ly slash threat of NatCon. Check those articles out. They're, they're uh, very substantial and highly relevant to the debate that we see in US politics today. Uh, at this point, I'd like to remind you about next week's episode of New Ideal Live. We'll be talking about a, a very different topic, uh, going to uh, something that is uh, highly theoretical, but very relevant philosophy. Why perfection is possible. Uh, I will be doing an interview with Dr. Harry Binswanger, who's a longtime associate of Ayn Rand's and who's a prominent objectivist philosopher. Tune in at the uh, normal time, Wednesday, March 23rd, for that interview. And uh, I think the time on that screen is wrong. Sorry about that. It's, it's going to be at uh, 2 p.m. Eastern time uh, and uh, 11 a.m. Pacific time. Sorry about that. Um, if you enjoyed today's podcast and you would like to follow us in the future, please subscribe to our channel on YouTube and click the bell to get a notification when we go live or when we post new videos. If you're watching the recording of this on YouTube, please uh, be sure to leave a comment, like the episode, share it. That helps optimize the algorithm so more people can find out what we're doing. Same is true on Facebook. If you're watching there, please like or comment on it or share this episode. And last of all, if you have any questions or comments on today's episode, please feel free to send us an email at newideal at uh, We read all the emails that come in. We answer many of them. We sometimes take suggestions that you give for new topics in the future. We're always interested in hearing those. So uh, thanks very much uh, for doing that. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Elon, for this conversation. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Till next time. And and we will see you all next week and shortly on Clubhouse. Thanks.